This is the Mathematics Education Podcast from MathEdPodcast.com. to the Math Ed Podcast. My name is Sam Otten from the University of Missouri, and I'm very pleased today to be joined by David Pym, who's a member of the Faculty of Education at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada. David, thanks so much for being here. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with you, Sam. We're going to be speaking about David's career in mathematics education, and he's been around different parts of the world and has delved into a lot of different topics, so we're going to have a lot of things to dig into. Um, but I also, in the interest of full disclosure, want to say that David is my academic grandfather, I think is the way you'd say that. My advisor was Beth Herbal Eisenman at Michigan State, and Beth's major advisor was David. And for your work uh, that we'll talk about in communication and language and meaning and metaphor, um, it is related to some things that I'm interested in, like that dissertation where I looked at the ways that students were participating in the classroom discourse. So we do have some, uh, you know, familial connections from grandfather to grandson. Yes. And I think the uh, uh, as I get older, I've just turned 65, um, I become more and more aware of the significance of the people I simply had the opportunity to engage with uh, along the way mm. and how they've shaped uh, a range of things that I've done and I'm sure a range of things that I now say uh, that other people have said beforehand. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the beginning, though. Um, how was it that you got started in mathematics education? How did your career kind of kick off? Well, I, I guess it depends when you think about my career. Um, I did an undergraduate degree at the University of Warwick in math, pure mathematics, um, and David Tor was one of the people there. He and also a couple of colleagues at the University of Southampton, uh, Brian Griffiths and Jeff Halson, were, I think, the two places at different universities where the first courses in mathematics education were offered within departments of mathematics. Mm. And so in 1972, I think it was, uh, I took a course in mathematics education from David Tall, and that began my interest, although it was in parallel and to some extent still is in parallel uh, with my interest in mathematics. Um, it, it developed from there. Okay. Uh, and then what was it that brought you into kind of pursuing a higher a degree and going into, you know, a doctorate kind of studies? So, so after three years in an undergraduate degree at Warwick, and I spent a year at Cambridge, um, and happened to be uh, in the same year as Andrew Wiles, and he and I played guitar together. <laughs> I got a, um, a Fulbright Award and went to Cornell to do a PhD in mathematics. Um, and very quickly, probably within the first semester, realized that was not what I was going to be doing for the rest of my life. But I had the very good fortune to encounter David Henderson, um, phenomenal geometer in the mathematics department. And working with him, and he supervised my master's thesis in maths education, which is where I made the switch. Okay. And I continued to teach to be a TA in the math department at Cornell. And he was a very significant influence. And to this day, um, in ways of thinking about geometry in particular, that don't have to do with arithmetic, don't have to do with number, hmm. but have to directly do with geometry itself uh, in its own um, frame. Mm -hmm. From then, uh, uh, after the master's degree, um, Jer Comfrey showed up as the as new PhD student the second year I was at uh, Cornell. But I moved uh, for personal reasons to the University of Wisconsin Madison uh, and enrolled in the PhD program there. Um, and for two years uh, worked more on mathematics education. Also, in uh, because I'd done a lot of statistics uh, at university as, as an undergraduate, I didn't do a minor in statistics. I did a minor in history of science, history of mathematics, mm. and that became another strand of uh, interest that stayed with me throughout my career. After two years there in the PhD program, um, I got an offer from Richard Skemp to come back to the University of Warwick to work with him as a research assistant, which I decided to do. So I ended the work I was doing in the PhD program there and went back to England in 1979. And Skemp is a, um, a name that people might know. Um, for me, the article about relational understanding, or I kind of think of it similar to conceptual understanding, 
and then instrumental understanding or uh, procedural understanding. And the metaphor about kind of the, the way to conceptualize those things has really stuck with me. Yes, and uh, for me too. And it's interesting, though, because actually, although it's it's always associated with Richard Skem, mm-hmm. it wasn't actually the distinction he made. In the paper he wrote in 1976, he says, uh, it's funny, I was actually just quoting it the, the other day. It was brought to my attention some years ago by Stieg Mellon Olsen of Bergen University that there are in current use two meanings of this word. The word was understanding. These he distinguishes by calling them relational understanding and instrumental understanding. Mm. So right from that article that gets so often quoted, Skemp is saying, this is not my distinction, it's somebody else's distinction. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting the way these things happen. Yeah, and that is interesting. And yeah, because I actually had totally forgotten that little part of it. And maybe it's about kind of the way Skemp wrote it and kind of brought life to the distinction, you know, and then that's what really sticks with people. Yep. And it was in um, Mathematics Teaching, the journal of the Association of Teachers of Mathematics that David Wheeler was heavily involved with as well. And I think it's a bit like Mian in 1979 wrote about um, IRE, in, uh, Initiation Response Evaluation. Mm-hmm. But that same distinction was actually made. And I think Mian refers to that as IRF, Initiation Response Feedback in 1975 by two uh, British linguists. But Meehan's IRE became the term that was used in mathematics education. Mm -hmm. Now that you're going back over there to uh, England, uh, what was it like working on their projects and kind of what were the ideas that they were grappling with and then you kind of joined the team over there? Well, it was actually quite an interesting experience because when I'd left England, I was still in pure mathematics. And then when I came back, People were assuming that, you know, I'd been in math education for, for a number of years. And so I'd know all these people in England whom I didn't, like Alan Bishop, for instance. But uh, because the month after I returned in 1979, um, Skemp was running PME3 mm. at the University of Warwick, and I was helping him with that. So I had this great experience of meeting 100 mathematics educators, mostly from Europe, some from North America. And uh, it was just sort of this wall of people that I was encountering and, you know, mm-hmm. helping them find food and arranging a disco. It, it, it wasn't actually an <laughs> academic encounter, but uh, <laughs> uh, nevertheless, it was a, a terrific engagement with that. Richard Skemp's project was on um, elementary mathematics, and it was around designing uh, a configuration of uh, elementary curriculum that was systematic and different from what had been in place for a number of years before that. So that was the first. I mean, I, I'd done some work as a research assistant uh, in Wisconsin, but this was the first time when I was actually employed on a particular project. Mm-hmm. Do you think that that experience, you know, that it's the elementary level, it's kind of curriculum related, which isn't directly tied to your main line of research that you'd pursue over the next few decades. But were there some ways that that work uh, in the elementary level with SCAMP uh, influenced your later thinking? To some extent, because one of the strands that's always come with me, whatever it is that I'm doing, is uh, a proximity to mathematics. And it got me thinking quite hard in some places about different aspects of um, arithmetic operations and so forth that I hadn't really thought about in a very long time. And funnily enough, it's now um, almost, dear me, 40 years later, I'm back there uh, working with Natalie Sinclair and Alf Coles in the UK about number, about maybe addition, subtraction and multiplication from a different point of view using an iPad app. Some of those things are coming back uh, from that period 40 years later. Uh, Mm. You know, I think it's one of the things that um, provided one's memory stays with one and um, (laughs) on the edge of that sort of slipping away a little bit. There's an opportunity for something that you think had no connection with something else suddenly to go, oh, That connects to whatever. One of the things that just popped in my mind was um, an article by William Thurston from the the mid 90s, uh, where he's talking about his own mathematics and um, how some of the things that he did drew in from a wide range, a really wide range of mathematics that he'd engaged with over the previous 15 or even 20 years. 
And I had the sense reading this that if he hadn't had those experiences, he wouldn't be able to do what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And I find that more and more as I get older, that there's the, the looking back and thinking, oh, yes, David Fowler said that. David Tall said that. Um, I remember some work on such and such. Um, and being able to integrate that, even though to some extent um, it's already there at a, I won't say unconscious level because I'm not keeping it um, away, but at a subconscious level, mm -hmm. the realization of, of coming back to that. So uh, your background involves pure mathematics, mathematics education, uh, this elementary work, uh, the nature of mathematics and science, as you mentioned. But what a lot of people might know you for is connections to language and communication and metaphor in mathematics. So I want to kind of move into the 1980s here where you were working on metaphor and analogy and then especially uh, communication in math classrooms. So how did that line of research start for you? Yes. And, and again, just in keeping with what I was saying before, it actually started in the 70s um, in that a very close friend of mine, Joanna Channel, whom I met as an undergraduate, moved into linguistics. And a lot of the background and information in, in linguistics uh, that I became aware of, I became aware of through her. Mm. Her PhD was on vague language and in particular the way round numbers are used or used to be used and now disappeared in the last 20 years. But in connection with informal observations about uh, approximately something um, or around that sort of sort of number. So that was my first formal encounter with linguistics. Um, but both at Cornell and in Madison, Wisconsin, because I wasn't taking other courses in statistics, I was taking courses in linguistics. And one of the talks I went to at uh, Cornell was where as a philosopher who asserted very clearly, there is no metaphor in mathematics. And right at that time, I thought, that doesn't seem right. <laughs> And so, um, I, you know, I didn't say it aloud, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it was one of the things that triggered me thinking about, really, is that is that so? And started looking around. And I think one of the places in which certain sorts of metaphor at least show up are in the changing notion of number as students uh, struggle and progress through elementary school and high school what number is and what its properties are shift probably four or five times if if they're successful. And each time there's a metaphoric extension because the, the noun ostensibly is the, is the same. But when you talk about fractional number or decimal number or real number or irrational number, whatever, those adjectives are messing with the noun, putting pressure on the noun. But the surface N-U-M-B-E-R doesn't change. And so that that I think was was one of the, the range of situations that I wrote a bit about in chapter four of speaking mathematically, the way in which um, uh, spherical triangle, the adjective spherical, if you accept it, puts pressure on the noun. Uh, spherical doesn't change. It just means sphere. But spherical triangle messes with triangle. Hmm. And uh, one of the things I think about increasingly moving through mathematics is you need to be very careful about the reference, I guess, for particular nouns that may seem familiar. Uh, again, during the year I was in Cambridge doing part three of the tripos, it's the equivalent of a master's degree in mathematics. Um, I remember seeing uh, now it may have been rotation. It made it a, a relatively straightforward word in a very abstract context. And I asked the lecturer, you know, what does this have to do with rotation? And he said, nothing. Hmm. So it was one of those things where uh, there are traces of those words. And again, this is a theme that seems to be coming up in this, this conversation, where, as in maths education over the last 40 years, in mathematics over the last 40 years, words both gain meaning and shift in meaning. And metaphor for me was a way of describing some aspects of those shift, those shifts a long way. But, you know, there are other things as well. Recently I came across, a, um, it was talking about asymptotes of functions and describing the, um, the asymptote as a magnet that was somehow pulling the function towards itself, but never quite actually getting there. That too is a metaphor. It's a real world metaphor. But it's different from the ones that are somehow inside mathematics itself. And so if I were describing the 
the place where I see myself having been for the last 40 years. It's in that interplay between aspects of language and aspects of mathematics. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not focused on a classroom situation and education. It's it's simply between language and mathematics. But at other times, and as a very rich resource for these things coming up, there's also looking at aspects of classroom language. One of the things that uh, got me heavily involved in that was um, after I left uh, working with Richard Skemp for two years, I went to the Shell Centre in Nottingham and worked with Alan Bell and Hugh Burkhart on different research projects, secondary school, one on uh, real problem solving and one on teaching of algebra. But at the beginning of 1983, I moved to the Open University and there for 17 years, I worked quite heavily on mathematics education courses and videotaping classrooms and producing uh, a range of video resources. And that really got my interest focused um, on certain aspects of classroom language, certain aspects in particular of teacher language in that situation. That's certainly what uh, became a major strand running through speaking mathematically. Hmm. In, in that was, I wrote that about five years, well, at least it was published about five years after I joined the Open University. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you talked about the philosopher who said there's no metaphor in mathematics and that inspired, you know, decades of work where you're thinking very (laughs) carefully about the metaphors and digging into them and unpacking them and everything. It reminds me of an interview I did like this with Tom Carpenter. Oh, yes. And he said that, you know, decades of his work in CGI and everything was also inspired by a psychologist who said something. And Tom Carpenter's like, I'm pretty sure that's wrong. And then he did his whole kind of research agenda to gather evidence that it was wrong. So it's just funny to see the the motivation that can come from just hearing somebody say something. And you're like, that doesn't seem quite right. Uh, uh, Yeah, exactly. The the mismatch of what you're hearing and some aspect of your experience can then actually stimulate a deeper exploration of something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Tom Carpenter, of course, was one of the people I I studied with and had courses from when I was in Wisconsin-Madison. Oh, that's great. Um, I, I want to continue forward a little bit, too, because you said, you know, in mathematics, uh, meaning can shift over time a little bit. And so I wanted to think about if you look back at your own writing and the own way that you're thinking about some of these topics. Um, and maybe you could use Speaking Mathematically, um, that book that you wrote, uh, I think, in the 80s. And then later you wrote a book called Symbols and Meanings in School Mathematics. Yep. Was that one in the 90s? That was, yeah, it was nearly 10 years later. At that point, I had the fantasy that I'd write a book every 10 years. But, oh. <laughs> that, that <didn't> work. <laughs> um, but I'm just curious, uh, you know, what do you see as your own shifts in the way that you're thinking about communication or language and mathematics uh, between those two books or across the, that 10 year period? The shift in, in focus, at least in terms of the those books, was the structure of the second book um, was more in terms of areas of mathematics in the curriculum. There was a chapter on number, a chapter on algebra, a chapter on geometry, a chapter on applied mathematics to some extent, and so on. And it was, for me, an opportunity to pursue in each of those the sense I had of a parallel pair of goals between symbolic fluency and understanding. If you look at the history of mass education in the last 60 or 70 years, normally one or other of those was offered as the sole goal. And by offering these two as a pair that you can work towards at any particular time, but they're hard to work at at the same time. In each of the curriculum areas of mathematics in school, I was interested in in instances where you could work at symbolic fluency first for a while before working at a greater understanding of the situation. Other situations where you may work at the understanding first and then work at symbolic fluency. But both of these I was seeing as the, the, the primary pillars. And in part because symbolic fluency allows, along with the automation that comes with that, you to give up your attention to it and spend your attention, which is always limited, not just being 65, but even at 25, mm-hmm. on something else. Um, and so that's one of the shifts, I guess, in, in, in focus that, yes, it's still focused on aspects of language in those various different curriculum areas. But speaking mathematically was organized more in terms of half the book on speech. I should have actually called it communicating mathematically, but that's not a 
a problem <laughs> and half of it on written uh, mathematics uh, with examples uh, from school in both of those sort of halves, but not very much focused on on curriculum. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the strand of history that continues to engage me and perturb me is that we lose so often even a relatively short sense of history after something's changed. Um, and that's true in mathematics, but it's also true, I think, in mathematics education. I'm old enough to have known people who knew the first people in mathematics education. So, for example, Richard Skemp was there in, in the 60s. Um, David Wheeler was there in the 50s and 60s, and I knew both of those well. Freudenthal I met. Um, and there are a number of other people who aren't alive now. But it's one of the things I think very soon, probably within a decade or so, that's going to go and nobody's going to know someone who, you know, you, you said at the beginning how you were interested in, in the history of, of people and mm -hmm. their connections and so on. I think there's a sense of the field losing that sense of people who knew people who knew the first people. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm saying first in the sense that for me, mathematics education uh, started pretty much after the Second World War. In the late 40s and early 50s, yes, there are obviously there are people earlier than that. But I think my sense is that they're individuals. But in this area of when are their conferences, when are their journals, mm -hmm. when are their research projects, um, that's 50s and 60s. The, you know, having a PhD in mass education in the U.S. started about a decade earlier than it did in the U.K. So. The first maths education professors were all mathematicians moving sideways. The next generation did their PhDs in the US and then came back to England. And then the next generation of that, Celia Hoyles might be an example, were a generation doing it inside the UK. And before that, yes, but I suspect they might have done it in psychology or they might have done it in something else. But mathematics education as a field to me, is a second half of the 20th century. And we're about now in the second decade of the 21st century, losing sight of that. And therefore, that sense of, uh, oh, yes, that was something that was around in the 70s, that was something around in the 60s. And it's different now. So language now is very different from language in 87, when speaking mathematically came out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I want to ask a little bit more about that, thinking about the present day and how you see the present day, um, and maybe staying on this thread of communication in mathematics. Where is your thinking right now on this topic? Like, what is still rolling around in your head as maybe an unanswered question um, intellectually? Or is there a particular topic related to communication in mathematics that you think the field should be trying to answer or study at this time? Well, a couple of times along the way, I've been asked about, you know, what did what did I miss? What did I leave out of speaking mathematically? And certainly anything about uh, multilingual, multicultural aspects of mathematics is not there. More recently, I think uh, one of the things that's in the distinction between language and communication is that of gestures. And I think there's a growing focus on gestures in and of themselves but there's also a growing focus on them through, in mathematics education, through um, touchscreen technology. Mm -hmm. And there's actually quite an interesting issue about if I put my finger on, I'm putting my finger on the screen, but nobody can see it. Um, <laughs> if I touch the screen, I'm doing something with my finger, but I'm also making a gesture with my finger. And yes, right back in the very early days when or someone's learning to count, your fingers are both the things you count with and the things you count. So fingers, I think, are a really interesting communicative aspect of being human, having them, uh, not just thumbs for iPhones and things, <laughs> that increasingly, I think, are and should be not just put under the desk, don't use your fingers, but uh, focused on as a significant element through which mathematics comes in both directions, from a person through their fingers and to a person through their fingers. So that, I think, is one of those things that, that communication as a whole, and again, gestures aren't just, particularly if you're Italian, aren't just with your fingers, they're with shoulders, they're with your body, 
it's seeing communication as a whole body action, whole body activity, uh, rather than something simply your lips do or part of your throat does. It's funny that, that, you know, it's always been materialistic. I think the, the language it's, it's something that, um, is a very physical thing to do. One of the things I'm spending a lot of time doing over the last 15 years or so is as choral singing. Uh, and boy, I can tell you what a physical activity that is. <laughs> I'm speaking with David Pym, a uh, emeritus professor from the University of Alberta and also now a uh, faculty of education at Simon Fraser University. Yeah, that's really a lot of interesting stuff to think about. And I have some friends, like Julie Nurmberger Haig. She's also interested in how the body is involved in mathematics learning. And I think that is a really interesting area that people have started to work on, but it seems like there's a lot that we still need to figure out about that. But I do also want to give you a chance to speak about some of the things that you did besides communication and language and mathematics. So what were some of the other research efforts that you were involved in that are maybe on a little bit of a separate research tract, but something also that you contributed some thinking to? Yes, that's that's interesting. Well, certainly um, a strand that runs, I think I mentioned this before, that runs right the way through is history of mathematics. And um, one of my colleagues at the university uh, was John Favell and another one was Jeremy Gray. And I also worked with them on uh, developing a history of mathematics course, undergraduate course. I suppose it, it is similar to some things I was saying earlier about having a historical ear where it's looking at the present, but realizing it's only the present and not it's always been this way. And therefore, looking back in history for places where it wasn't that way. Mm -hmm. It was something different. People were writing about it differently, thinking about it differently. One of my significant teachers was David Fowler, who was a mathematician at the University of Warwick and who, towards the later part of his life, worked very intensely on early Greek mathematics, uh, pre-Euclidean mathematics, where there was a very, very different definition of ratio around and jumping forward to me working with David Henderson on geometry and me learning from him that angle is one of the most common, apparently straightforward geometric notions. And yet any definition, any definition at all that's applied to a triangle gives you either no angles, three, uh, six angles, 12 angles but never gives you three angles. Mm -hmm. So despite its name and uh, uh, Robert record in England wanted to prefer to call it a three side rather than a mm -hmm. triangle. Mm -hmm. Triangles don't have three angles by any definition that's out there. Um, and angle seems to be one of the most challenging things to work at. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think has to do with, with its dynamic component so again, it's to do with, with language, but, um, there's an, a number of people in Canada, uh, working with First Nations languages and looking there and finding that, um, they're far more verbally based than noun based. And so for me, one of, so this is coming back to an earlier question about something that, that's missing. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that's missing is time. Studying time, yes, in the context of language, but also in the context of mathematics itself, because 19th century, 20th century mathematics tries to burn time away. Mm -hmm. And that one of the things that the return of certain forms of technology, uh, particularly in dynamic geometry, but not solely there, is requiring the return of not just dynamism, but time, whether it's in learning to become more fluent accounting, uh, which is something I'm involved, as is mentioned, with Alf Coles and Natalie Sinclair on, or something else. The ordinal aspect of counting is far more significant than you will pick up from looking at any classroom uh, textbook and is something that can work very early at fluency. And when you have a curriculum that says in kindergarten you do the numbers from one to 10. And then in grade one, you might do the numbers from one to 20. It's nonsense. It's nuts. Um, but, uh, but there we are. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not sure there. I actually answered your question, but so maybe ask it again. 
No, no, I think that's good. I basically just wanted to open it up to some other things that, that you've thought about over the years besides just the, uh, the communication line and definitely gave us a few things there to chew on. The angle one, even just as a very specific kind of content piece, is interesting to me. Is we've had debates here uh, at Mizzou when we're working with the elementary pre-service teachers, and so we're dealing with the concept of angle. And, you know, our group kind of doesn't like some of the typical um, elementary textbook definitions of angle, but then we are kind of like, but what's a better definition? And some of the people here proposed uh, amount of rotation. But then I'm like, oh, that's, that's totally fine, and there's a lot you can do with that. But then I'm like, but some physical or geometric objects – they never actually rotated. They just exist with, you know, sides that are open at this angle and they never rotated one to the other. They just sat there. Or I imagined like take a piece of wood and then chisel out and, you know, an angle in the wood. The wood that's on the bottom never rotated to the wood that's on the top. They both just exist there, but they have what we could call an angle between them. So we, you know, we would just have debates about this, about what really is an angle. And if we define it one way, what does it leave out and what does it emphasize? Yes. Yes. I think the I'll find the name of the, the author, but there's a significant distinction, I think, between definition by genesis and definition by property that, again, has disappeared. Definition by genesis, particularly in the context of geometry, is saying what you do to create the object. Mm-hmm. And definition by property is is more familiar to some extent, uh, which is saying it is this thing. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things, you know, in definition by Genesis, there's time, there's a process, there's uh, often a dynamic uh, situation that is generating the thing that you want to focus on. And in the context of the ellipse, the nomenclature shifted from a period before Apollonius, where it was definition by Genesis in terms of different ways of cutting a cone, mm. orthotome, ambletome, can't remember, um, to saying that this property is not just a property, but we're using it as a defining property. And so, uh, and then ellipse, parabola, hyperbola came, came from that, the, the falling short one, the exact one, the uh, exceeding one, mm-hmm. uh, which had to do with the different, the different relationships there. And I think the um, the case of angle is like that, too, that if you're taking a definition by Genesis, which says um, an angle is created by a rotation, then there's a lot of places you can go with that at the very early stage. And there's a um, doctoral thesis finished uh, just last year, one of Natalie Sinclair's students uh, who worked very intensely um, with kindergarten and grade one students using um, some dynamic software about that notion of rotation. But I think the, the definitions you'll find in, in textbooks, particularly if there are mathematicians looking over the author's shoulders, are uh, in terms of property. Uh, and there's the confusion about whether angles have segments for sides or rays for sides or lines for sides, rather than all of those mm-hmm. at, at, at different points. And the complications that come up in trying to define it, I think, uh, have to do with trying to find a property that because of the current and it's not just, you know, recent, but but certainly I think in the 20th century, a desire to see the metry in geometry as being metric, i.e. arithmetic. And therefore, you know, the definition of congruence doesn't have to do with, oh, this segment can be transformed, translated, rotated, reflected, whatever, onto that one. And that's why they're congruent. No, it has the same length and the same with angle. Two angles are the same if they have the same measure. And that, I think, is a pretty poor notion about angles being the same. Hmm. Before we wrap up here, I want to step out again even a little bit broader. Um, if we, If you look at the current state of mathematics education as a field and you have perspective being in multiple different countries uh, active in math education. What do you see as a a grand challenge that the field needs to address? A grand challenge. One of the things that may be a good reason to ask me and maybe a poor reason to ask me is I see myself as being not in the mainstream. (laughs) Partly, I think it's the history And, you know, when I moved to North America 20 years ago, I had to reinvent myself as a teacher educator. I'd done some teaching while in the UK, master's courses and individual, again, professional education 
courses, but had never been involved in teacher education and had not been a teacher of mathematics. So while I'd studied through the videotapes in 17 years at the Open University and learned a great deal about being able to talk about aspects of teaching in particular, uh, teaching mathematics of the language of teaching mathematics. I wasn't a teacher educator. Um, you know, I survived. I stayed employed. I got to, uh, you know, worked at Michigan State for a couple of years, University of Alberta for 10 years and almost 10 years now at, at Simon Fraser working part time. But also, I think because of the influences of people who inspired me, David Wheeler, Dick Tata, who, if you look at his heritage, he taught um, Stephen Hawking when he was, Stephen was a student at school. These were people, as was David Fowler, who were university-based but didn't have a PhD. David Wheeler created both for the learning of mathematics, uh, which for me is the most significant journal in mathematics education in the world. Uh, yes, I was the second editor, but um, <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> I was still a as well as the Canadian Mass Education Study Group, uh, which is a very non-standard, uh, no research paper presentation conference. It's not quite a Zamizdat group, but I have this sense of being along the edge of mathematics education. Let me be you know, overt about this. I'm not sure I actually do research. I do academic work and bring into mathematics education often um, some relatively unusual literature, um, most recently in poetry, for example. But I'm not someone who does research project after research project. Um, uh, and yet I've got to the end of my career, pretty much. So if I offer a view on this, it's a view from the edge, uh, not the cutting edge. Uh, I've lived most of my life at the trailing edge of technology. I don't have a cell phone, for example. But it's it's on the outside, the perimeter, to some extent, looking in. And one of the things I think that needs to be better is actually writing about mathematics education research. There, there are a number of things that I can rant about but won't, you know. Uh, well, maybe I will. Um, <laughs> the, the massive increase in bibliography, for example, which seems to me simply getting in the way. Hmm. But there's an, an, I think there's a certain nervousness or uneasiness about, oh, I have to cite this, I have to cite this, I have to cite this. Hmm. And people not being willing to trust their readers. One of the things that I've, I've learned from, from working in poetry and going on poetry courses is over and over again, very, very high-end poets will say, trust your reader. Mm -hmm. Don't feel that you need to lay the trail or that the person you're writing for is a first year graduate student or um, someone else. And one of the things about for the learning of mathematics is that um, there are articles published in there that take a lot for granted. And I think the, and again, without citing any names, uh, some other journal articles are stereotyped in a way that kills the subject that they're writing about. The way you're describing that actually makes me think of something that's been a pet peeve of mine as well in our field uh, in the empirical articles is the the really, to me, I would call overblown literature reviews and that it feels like they're kind of trying to write a book before they tell me what their study was or what they collected and how they analyzed it and what they found. For me, I really love reading articles and sometimes I have to go to other disciplines to get these, but I love the articles where they say, here's the here's the issue. Here are a couple key studies that you need to know to set the stage, but now let me just tell you what I did. And it's literally, you know, a handful of citations, but they're all directly relevant and they are exactly what's needed to set the stage for the new findings. And then boom, let's like look at let's look at what you did and what you found. Like to me, I, I love that kind of process of getting into it rather than I need to read page after page after page of all this context and making sure I'm giving nods to this, this and this. And I'm, you know, I really want to kind of cut to what was your question and then what did you look at? Yes. And why? Mm -hmm. Too often I think there's there's what you did, but no explicit explanation of why you did this rather than, than something else. And again, just to promote it, um, one of the things the best articles in the learning of mathematics do, for, in my view of things, is are the ones that start with a bit of data. Hmm. 
and they simply give you know maybe it might be a transcript of six or eight lines of something it might be something somebody's noticed mm-hmm. um and should we, and it, should we take a closer it, look at this be in rather than having to get through 18 pages or 22 pages of a 35 page article before anything shows up as you said that is to do with the authors mm-hmm. and the work they've done rather than uh there's this there's this there's this there's this so i think there's there's a strong need, let's say, in the field to become better writers about the phenomena uh, of interest and to break the traditional cycle, and that's a challenge for some journals more than others, about how the format is supposed to be. Hmm. Back in the 19th century, when Euclid was the uh, primary, certainly geometry text, but more than that, primary text of study, a diagram was marked wrong if it didn't have the same letters that Euclid's, well, it wasn't by Euclid, we don't have those diagrams, mm-hmm. but, you know, five, seven, eight hundred years later, mm-hmm. the diagrams had been lettered in a particular way. And if you didn't use the same letters, it was marked wrong. <laughs> and similarly, I think to some extent, uh, there are some journals where if you don't use the template, you know, PME is another example where there's a fixed template, CERME is another one, uh, where there may be two cent templates depending on if it's theoretical or if it's empirical primarily. But it's, you know, a template can be helpful, but it all can also be very, very constraining. And just like the research that was done around PowerPoints and how they were completely limiting the presentations that people were giving Mm -hmm. just by being the template into which you put bullet points and Mm -hmm. things of that sort. Mm -hmm. I think there's, there's a need for more interesting, more exciting, more open and potentially more wrong, but wrong doesn't mean not interesting Mm -hmm. and, and right can mean intensely dull and skip it to the next one and skip it and skip it. (laughs) All right. I've got one more question for you, David. Uh, If, if you actually did not spend your career in this, you know, mathematics, history of mathematics, mathematics education, you know, kind of fringes of this field. Um, but if you actually just left that and had done something completely different with your life, what might that have been? And in response to that, it, my question back to you is, is at what stage would I not be in math education? You know, <laughs> are, you, are you talking about the, uh, a, a key, a key turning point world? in your life? Uh, the key turning point could have been after high school or somewhere, you know, it, it, you can decide where you want to start writing this alternative timeline. Right. OK, well, because you've given me the choice, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll make it 1991, uh, which was when I had my first sabbatical year away ever uh, from the Open University. It was here in Vancouver and I started to learn the saxophone. Yes, I was doing my first graduate teaching classes in North America as well. When I returned, I joined a choir for the first time. I'd, I'd been, you know, in my primary school, I'd been a quite a good singer, but my voice broke very early when I was 11. And so I hadn't sung for 30 years. Hmm. And that's a strong focal interest, vocal focal interest <laughs> Uh, of mine uh, right through until now. And just two weeks ago, I had the choice of going to the Canadian Method Study Group, which was at university an hour from here, or singing in a concert in Victoria. And there was absolutely no question it was singing in a concert in Victoria. (laughs) Another thing that I've been doing, again, probably in not quite as long as that, but the last 15 years, no, well, getting older all the time, 20 years, is writing poetry. and yes, the things I'm learning and finding out about poetry, I'm feeding back into my mathematics methods class, into some of the writing I've been doing. And that, I think, is this thing about associationism, that um, whenever I read something else, it tends to show up in my next bit of writing, whether it's a film, whether it's, uh, in this case, a, a book about writing poetry, something else. Mm, that reminds me, choral singing is the next thing that clearly is going to work in. Um, <laughs> but, oh, that is interesting. Actually, now, now I just said that. Um, it's already there because one of the things about this concert, um, and, and may, this may be too um, particular, but it was uh, Rachmaninoff's All Night Vigil and the 
piece we were singing was an hour long and it was in old church Slavonic. So it wasn't even in Russian. We had to learn phonetically to be fluent at singing in old church Slavonic. And it was a really interesting thing where um, I could have looked at the translations to have a connection to a sense. And some of them were translations of texts I'd come across in English, but that actually didn't help with the fluency. What I needed to do was to work at the sounds and only the sounds. And there's a whitehead quotation I remember, at least I think I remember, which is um, at a certain level, language is nothing but a series of squeaks. And one of the things that uh, choral singing brings into play when you're singing in languages that you may not have a bit of experience of or no experience of um, Icelandic, um, Northern Scandinavian, whatever is you're in this position of learning sounds. And any time you're trying to work a language, again, you've got those two pillars. You've got what are the things I know about the sounds and what are the things I know about the context and the situation and the meaning. And both of those may help in different ways, but you get to choose one which you're going to do today and which one you're going to do tomorrow, and which one you're going to do the, the next day from that. So if I hadn't been my career i don't think i'd have become a professional singer even though my cousin is i don't think i'd become a professional poet and even if i did you can't make a living out of that (laughs) um but the other thing that i got from the open the years at the open university was becoming an academic editor Hmm. and that's again a term that the open university used so i was both a member of the mathematics education faculty but I was also becoming more and more experienced and trained in editing other people's writing. And uh, currently now I work with Natalie Sinclair on the Springer Journal Digital Experiences in Mathematics Education that she edits. And I've created myself as the academic editor. Mm -hmm. And so I work on every article that's accepted. That's part of it that you need to do this sort of editing. You need to be an insider. It's not simply technical editing. But it's also partly technical editing. And if I can end with a a joke, uh, my father suffered me going through high school and having to cope with English. And I never wrote well and I never wrote anything. And then 15 years later, I was at the Open University and he said, people are paying you to edit their writing. (laughs) Uh, So I think if I didn't become a mathematics educator, I would probably be working for a publisher and working on editing. Mm-hmm. Well, David, uh, thanks so much for your time. I've really enjoyed the conversation with you. Good talking to you. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, uh, who knows what will come of this. 